Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. You have joined the Floor Innovation Builders webinar entitled Out of the Fog and Into Renewable Diesel. My name is Maureen Price, and I will be the moderator for our presentation today. I am the leader for Floor's Business Transformation and Innovation team. We focus on new and innovative ideas, never losing sight of the critical thinking and analysis that comes from our global team of experts. Our people are at the core of our success. This webinar series is an opportunity to showcase specific expertise and to talk about new trends or recent code changes of significant impact to our industry. As with the other webinars, this will be a technical presentation. Our speakers will talk about processing of renewable feedstocks in conventional refining units. Although hydro treating these feedstocks appears to be very similar to conventional refining units, there are important differences and they need to be properly addressed during engineering. We have two subject matter experts with us this morning. I'd like to introduce Gary first. Gary is a senior fellow and technical director with more than 28 years of experience and specialization in hydro processing and renewable fuels. His expertise includes new technology development, conceptual design, scale up, detailed design, and troubleshooting. In his spare time, Gary is at peace with a fishing pole on a quiet lake. Joining Gary is Matt Reisdorf. Matt has more than 20 years of experience in the process design of refineries, chemical complexes, and in the work processes and execution of process design work. He provides expert leadership in crude vacuum system design, hydro processing, and overall facility configuration. Matt is an office favorite for his memorable lip sync performances in support of our Floor Cares charity activities. Thank you, Maureen. To begin today's presentation, Matt will provide an overview of the incentives and revenue associated with renewable diesel production, along with potential future demand. Then we will look at some of the most commonly used feedstocks, the processing steps involved in their conversion. We'll also review some of the key renewable feedstock properties that influence the design of a processing unit. Finally, we'll highlight some of the challenges associated with standalone units versus integration into an existing refinery. Matt, take it away. Thanks, Gary. Many refiners and investors have been watching the financial returns of some of the pioneers in the renewable diesel market space. The first major project of the current wave of renewable diesel in the U.S. is the Diamond Green Diesel Facility. It grew to a reporting capacity of about 18,000 barrels a day through about $600 million in reported capital costs over the last decade. In the last two years, the facility has recorded operating income of over $600 million each year, essentially a one-year simple payback. The current expansion plans to continue this profitable trend with the anticipated approximately two-year simple return. This profitability of renewable diesel is driven by credits and incentives. And we want to start with some background of how those incentives work together and what that means for the future of this market. In the US, two incentives are seen nationwide and apply to both biodiesel and renewable diesel. The $1 per gallon blenders tax credit turns on and off with time and with the whims of Congress. Those vacillations are buffered by the renewable fuel standard, which as a mandate allows its RIN values to rise and fall to cover the difference and allow the price of biofuels to rise to match the cost of their production. On top of these two long-standing credits, the current market is driven strongly by low carbon fuel standard programs, starting in California and now extending to other states and to the whole of Canada. In this table, the low carbon fuel standard credit is approximately equal to the combined value of the federal programs and is in addition to those programs. This diagram gives some more color to the way that renew the re renewable diesel market is driven by its ability to earn credits above and beyond those of the biodiesel market. 
Biodiesel competes on a national market for RIN and Blender's tax credits, as shown in the bottom half of this diagram. The marginal producer, using soybean oil as a feedstock, generally sees low margin potential, as the large biodiesel production capacity drives the incentive value to match the production cost. Renewable diesel can be blended at high concentrations into the diesel pool which allows it to be pushed into the high value markets, which have instituted a low carbon fuel standard. It allows effectively moving low carbon feedstocks into the markets where they are most valued. To demonstrate this with real world data, I'd like to share a graph on the next slide. The blue portion at the bottom of this, of this graph combines all of the low margin incentives which are effectively rolled into the national price of biodiesel. These effectively cover the feedstock price, but do not provide some significant margin or return on investment. The high margin incentives at the top of the graph include both the small additional RIN credit shown in orange and the larger low carbon fuel standard shown in green. The different green colors show the difference in value between different feedstocks for the low carbon fuel standard. The reported revenue per gallon for two large producers in the California market is shown in the red line, with a price that is driven strongly by the low carbon fuel standard incentive. This graph shows a model of the expected renewable diesel demand to meet the laws on the books today. Even with a high rate of growth of electric vehicles and other low carbon transportation options, a significant gap exists that current technologies can only fill using renewable diesel. The yellow line on this graph shows that demand. Demand for renewable diesel barrels grows exponentially later in the decade as the large market of Canada ramps up its program and as the most carbon efficient feedstocks like used cooking oil become exhausted. The operating and expected projects list only those that focus output on the North American market. Even if all these projects are built on schedule, there is still an ongoing gap between production capacity and the regulations on the books today in North America. Laws can of course change, and any additional regulation focused on low carbon transportation fuels has the potential to further increase demand above what is shown on this graph. The range of potential renewable feedstocks spans from vegetable oils to fats, greases, and used cooking oil. Soybean oil is currently the most popular feedstock, likely based on its availability and characteristics. However, other feedstocks, such as distillers corn oil, beef tallow, and used cooking oil, have a lower carbon intensity, which means that they earn more low carbon fuel standard credits. Why, you ask? It's because these carbon intensity scores are determined using a so-called well-to-wheels life cycle assessment. Distillers corn oil, for example, is recovered post-fermentation during the production of ethanol. As such, the ethanol carries the energy burden up until that point in the process. The commonality amongst all of these fats, oils, and greases is that they are comprised primarily, primarily of triglycerides. Triglycerides are comprised of three fatty acids, shown in green, which are attached to glycerol, shown in brown and blue, to form a triester. Fortunately, chemists have developed a shorthand nomenclature for the rest of us. As shown in this example, the carbon number of the fatty acid is indicated first, followed by the number of double bonds it possesses. Since renewable diesel production breaks down triglycerides into their constituent parts, the free fatty acid distribution is about all we need to define the composition of a given oil, excluding, of course, the impurities. Feedstocks shown in this table have certified pathways and carbon intensity scores in accordance with California's low carbon fuel standard for renewable diesel production. There are a lot of numbers here, but if we focus in on the concentrations of 10 weight percent and higher, we see 
that the C16 and C18 carbon numbers are most prevalent. As a side note, the preponderance of even carbon numbers is not coincidental. Rather, it's courtesy of Mother Nature's biosynthesis pathway that uses a two-carbon building block. Here, we can see at a glance why diesel is readily produced from renewable feedstocks. Since diesel fuel does not have a front-end distillation specification, it can accommodate the entire range of carbon numbers provided by the free fatty acids. Inevitably, some quantity of light ends and naphtha will be produced during the processing of these feedstocks. These byproducts require simple stabilization of the renewable diesel to meet its flashpoint specification. Unlike diesel, jet fuel does have a front end distillation specification. Specifically, the maximum true boiling point temperature at 10% recovery is 365 degrees Fahrenheit. This is about midway between NC10 and NC11. Consequently, from a boiling point perspective alone, a combination of hydrohysomerization and hydrocracking is needed for renewable jet production. No matter what feedstock is used, the renewable diesel process is a bit of a celebrity in the current market. And like any movie star, it requires a significant supporting cast to keep it working. Raw oil pretreatment can be performed on site or off site and may differ somewhat depending upon feedstock and contaminant types. Hydrogen production can be integrated to the facility purge and off gas system, or it can be more at arm's length. The final product separation system can also vary depending upon whether jet, diesel, or both are produced. The renewable diesel reactions are complex with multiple different reaction pathways. Hydrodeoxygenation, the HDO pathway, requires a high hydrogen production, but preserves an additional carbon atom in the diesel product, increasing yield. The water produced as a byproduct can be easily separated. Decarboxylation or decarbonylation, often abbreviated as the DCO or DCN pathways, alone require less hydrogen, but they produce a somewhat lower yield as some of the carbon in the feed is converted to CO or CO2. As a secondary effect, that CO and CO2 then needs to be separated out of the reaction products, which is much more difficult than for water. The worst of all potential pathways is to combine the DCO or DCN reaction with the reverse water gas shift and methanation side reactions. These have the same lower yield of diesel product, but instead of just making CO and CO2, they consume precious hydrogen to produce methane, which is even harder to separate in the reaction products. While all of these reaction pathways may be present, the prevalence of each is determined by the choice of catalyst and operating conditions. As catalysts age and reaction condi conditions adjust, the balance may shift somewhat between these pathways. Understanding these pathways and how they apply to your facility can be a key component of licensor and catalyst selection for the renewable diesel process. We'll talk about this difference with a couple of examples on the next slide. With the same feedstock, and the same makeup gas, the difference in catalyst selection and reaction type can impact the yields and the unit design. Higher HDO reaction on the left side of this table uses more hydrogen but produces more product. Higher DCO reaction on the right side of this table uses less hydrogen but produces less product as some carbon is lost to CO2. As you move to the right side of the table, the need for including an amine-based or other system to target removal of CO2 from the reaction products increases. This process does hydrotreat renewable diesel, but its operating conditions and its needs are much greater than a typical petroleum diesel hydrotreater. 
The hydrogen consumption for the renewable diesel process is closer to a petroleum hydrocracker than a hydro treater. With the high, high level of oxygen in the feed, the potential heat release is even higher. The renewable diesel process incorporates and amplifies all of the process concerns of, of petroleum hydrocracking, one of which is a voracious appetite for hydrogen. As Gary mentioned, the low carbon fuel standard program is based on a well to wheels or field to wheels type approach. With the incentive based on the difference between the carbon intensity of a production method against the standard. The table shows the current standard compared with the reported carbon intensity of sellers to the California market over the last two years. A significant portion of the remaining carbon intensity of renewable diesel, as much as a third, may come from hydrogen production, depending on the source. Any steps taken to reduce the carbon intensity of the hydrogen can directly reduce the carbon intensity of the final fuel product and directly increase the incentives and the value of the product. There are several ways to utilize the renewable diesel byproducts to reduce the carbon intensity of hydrogen. If an SMR reformer is used to produce hydrogen, then off gas, LPG, or even naphtha can be used as feed. Some modifications may be needed at the front end of the hydrogen plant to process heavier feeds, but this can directly convert renewable molecules into a partially renewable hydrogen source. Off gas can also be fired as reformer furnace fuel. If a purge stream is utilized as a means of light ends removal, passing that to a PSA unit for hydrogen recovery minimizes the hydrogen needs. Using the PSA in the hydrogen plant also effectively passes any renewable hydrocarbon in the purge gas to the firebox as renewable fuel for the furnace. With appropriate commercial arrangements, these opportunities for carbon intensity reduction may exist, even if the hydrogen production facility is owned by a third party. Additional opportunities may also exist. In particular, if a facility is located in an area with a geography conducive to carbon capture and sequestration, adding a carbon capture system may provide opportunities to earn both carbon credits through a program like the US45Q, as well as to reduce the carbon intensity of your diesel product. With renewable feedstock and carbon capture, the hydrogen used could even be net carbon negative. All hydro processing processes produce some off gas, fuel gas, and naphtha, but the renewable diesel process has some unique aspects. Propane is a major component due to the hydro processing of glycerin in the feedstock. To maximize profitability, renewable diesel producers need to either build or find a market for renewable propane, or to ensure that this valuable byproduct is used in a way to capture regulatory incentives. CO2 and water may be significant contributors to the off-gas stream. This leads to metallurgy and corrosion concerns, and also to concerns of condensation. H2S is a much smaller component in the process compared to petroleum processes, but is still present due to the need of sulfiding catalyst. The off-gas rate will vary with unit design. As with traditional hydroprocessing, it varies by severity, and in this case, that severity is often driven by the need to improve cold flow properties. Catalyst selection and the different reaction pathways has a major influence. A key route to the increased profitability of renewable diesel is finding a way to utilize all three byproduct streams, the renewable naphtha, renewable LPG, and off-gas, in a way that captures incentives. As Matt has presented, both the HDO and DCO pathways produce essentially pure N-parapins from the fatty acids. N-octadecane 
the most abundant of these components has a melting point of 83 degrees Fahrenheit. In other words, it's a solid at room temperature. To meet the viscosity and cold uh, flow specifications of diesel fuel, it's clear that hydroisomerization is needed. For renewable diesel production, hydroisomerization may appear to be deceptively benign, as chemical hydrogen consumption and associated heat release are very low. Nonetheless, these catalysts are bifunctional, with acid and metal sites, just like hydrocracking. In simple terms, it has the potential for runaway. So this portion of the process needs to be designed with the same safeguards as a hydrocracker. Hydroisomerization can be performed in either a sour or sweet environment, depending upon product objectives and specifications. Reuse of a single-stage hydroprocessing unit, like a distillate hydrotreater, is facilitated by the use of a base metal catalyst, which is suitable for sour service. With this configuration, both the HCO and HI reactors can utilize a common recycle gas circulation. In contrast, Two-stage hydroprocessing units are ideal for the use of a noble metal catalyst, which requires a sweet environment. The two-stage configuration is expected to have a higher distillate yield as mild operating conditions reduce losses due to cracking. We've already seen that some hydrocracking is needed to produce renewable jet. The two-stage configuration provides the proper environment for this hydrocracking, along with the extent of hydroisomerization needed for arctic grade diesel. This graph provides a sense of how much hydroisomerization of straight chain paraffins is necessary to achieve various levels of pore point reduction. Researchers used n-hexadecane with a melting point of about 65 degrees Fahrenheit as a model compound along with a zeolitic platinum catalyst. For various extents of and hexadecane conversion, they measured the extent of branching and corresponding pore points. From this graph, we can infer that multi-branch isomerization is needed to meet the summer and more so winter cloud point specifications for carb diesel. This is especially apparent considering that N-octadecane, which is more abundant from processing of renewable diesel feedstocks, and its melting point is about 18 degrees higher than the N-hexadecane. As a final note, the pore point needed for Arctic diesel was not even achieved in this research. Now let's have a brief look at the physical and chemical properties of these fats, oils, and greases. While a few of the test methods are different than those used to characterize petroleum stocks, analogous information is being obtained. For example, Free fatty acids are a measure of the carboxylic acid content. Multiplication by a factor of two approximates the total acid number, or TAN, which is typically used to quantify potential corrosivity due to naphthenic acids. It's important to note that sulfur plays a role in carboxylic acid corrosivity. The lower sulfur content in renewable stock feedstocks relative to typical petroleum-derived stocks increases the acid corrosivity due to insufficient protection of the metal surfaces by iron sulfide. However, there is a lack of public domain information on appropriate materials of construction for fatty acids as a function of their concentration and the prevailing operating conditions. To support our future projects, FLUR is now a member of the Materials Technology Institute. MTI has an ongoing project entitled Corrosion in Bio-Oils. This project is currently performing a literature search and developing a test program to provide the necessary data to enable fit-for-purpose material selection. Here's a quick visualization of the portions of renewables units potentially impacted by the free fatty acids present in the feedstock. Depending upon the TAN, carbon steel metallurgy may not be acceptable for the low temperature feed section. Corrosion in this area could result in plugging of the downstream catalyst beds. At the elevated temperatures downstream, higher molybdenum content stainless steels may be needed to accommodate high tan feedstocks. In some cases, even conventional 321, 347 stainless steel piping and reactor overlays 
may not be adequate. This poses challenges when repurposing existing hydroprocessing units for renewables production. Existing metallurgy may limit feedstock options or the selected method of pretreatment for the revamp projects. In addition to TAN, the nitrogen and chloride contents are also important due to the potential for wet hydrogen chloride corrosion and ammonium chloride under deposit corrosion. Remember when Matt mentioned that water is a significant byproduct of the HDO pathway? Well, the high water concentration in the reactor effluent train increases its relative humidity and water dew point. This increases the potential for both of these hydrogen chloride related corrosion mechanisms when these contaminants are present in the renewable feedstock. Having scoured the open literature, reported values for the chloride content for renewable feedstocks are not readily available. So it is an important activity at the beginning of a project to select design chloride content to be used for process and metallurgical design. This may require laboratory testing or input from the process licensor and should not be overlooked. Wet hydrogen chloride corrosion is known to have already caused a loss of containment in a renewable diesel facility. As we saw previously, carbon monoxide and especially carbon dioxide are byproducts of the DCO pathway. Formic and carbonic acid solutions are formed when these components are dissolved in water. These acids impact metallurgical selections in the effluent train, both upstream and downstream of the wash water injection point. Prior to injection, such as an area with dashed highlighting, it is important to, to appropriately design to ensure that there's uh, water condensation is avoided. As with conventional hydroprocessing units, the injection location is dictated by contaminant concentrations and the prevailing environment. Wash water injection avoids the occurrence of a highly acidic dew point by driving the effluent below its water dew point temperature. The injection can be coupled with the use of a static mixer to promote scrubbing of the hydrogen chloride, which will mitigate the potential for ammonium chloride under deposit corrosion downstream. The renewable feedstock properties shown at the bottom of this table are addressed in a similar manner to conventional refinery stocks. Iodine value is similar to bromine number in that it indicates the olefinicity of the triglycerides fatty acids. Vegetable oils are more olefinic than animal fats, but both require special handling, analogous to a coker or FCC crack stocks, such as nitrogen blanketed storage. Renewable feedstock viscosities and pore points are similar to heavy gas oils, and they must be accounted for in hydraulics, heat transfer modeling, equipment specifications, storage, and handling. Animal fats have higher pore points than vegetable oils because they contain more saturated fatty acids. So high pore points correspond to low iodine values and vice versa. This diversity in properties can be used to select so-called bracketing feedstocks for design. Vegetable oils have higher chemical consumption and associated heat release, while animal fats require higher maintenance temperatures. As we saw in the properties table, sulfur is typically a very minor component in most renewable feedstocks. While this sounds like a good thing, it really isn't. Metal sulfided catalysts are used to break down the triglycerides via the HDO and HCO pathways. So hydrogen sulfide is needed in the reaction loop to avoid reduction of the catalyst. To compound this challenge, the hydrogen sulfide is commingled with the byproduct carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide. In a standalone renewable facility, a sulfide in agent can be continuously injected as a source of sulfur. Then, of course, the sulfur has to be either recovered and recycled or disposed of. One disposal approach is an iron scavenger, which is more cost effective than caustic scrubbing due to the commingled carbon dioxide. In a renewable facility that is integrated with a refinery, several sources of sulfur include one being sour water from another hydroprocessing unit, 
as well as hydrogen streams that also contain hydrogen sulfide. An integrated facility can utilize AMI systems and sour water strippers to take advantage of an existing sour plant, sulfur plant. Because the hydrogen sulfide will be commingled with carbon dioxide, the sulfur plant may need to be check rated to ensure that the reaction furnace temperature is acceptable for all of the components that need to be destroyed therein. In addition to sulfur management, utilities are another challenge for a standalone renewables facility. On the demand side, as we've noted, renewable feedstocks have high pour points. They require a heat source for unloading, storage, and handling. Steam is a common heating medium for this purpose. Then, of course, there are the decisions to be made regarding the use of turbine drivers, which may reduce unwanted shutdowns and save on throttling power via variable speed. Demand, of course, needs to be satisfied by supply. Potential production sources include the hydrogen plant and generation using waste heat within the renewables unit. Coordination with the hydrogen plant and renewables unit licensors will be required here. The hydrogen plant will also need the flexibility to accommodate the variation in hydrogen demand for the various design feedstocks, as well as flexibility in renewables production capacity. Last but not least is the flare system. Because hydroisomerization is hydrocracking, licensors will likely require an automatic depressurization to safeguard against reaction runaway. The flare system also needs to be designed to accommodate the release of high pour point feedstocks, as well as the waxy straight chain paraffins prior to their hydroisomerization. As Matt presented, in the opening slides, the demand for renewable fuels is growing rapidly. To meet this demand and profit from the financial incentives, many entities are looking to enter the renewable fuels production business. Speed to market is a key driver in the challenging revamp projects that we are currently executing. For clients pursuing a grassroots facility, we have developed a modular offering designed to help reduce the overall project implementation timeline. This model shot has been caricaturized to avoid giving away the magic beans, but you won't have to stalk us after this presentation to learn more about it. Please reach out at your convenience. With that, I'll pass it back to Maureen to see if any questions have come in. Thank you, Gary. Thank you, Matt. Um, we do have a few questions that have come in, um, but I just want to encourage the audience that now is the time to get your questions um, answered. So please add them into the Q and A. The first question is going to go to Matt. And so Matt, um, have people challenged or proven the carbon intensity of the renewable diesels as reported by the regulators? Yes, thanks. So, so as, as the question implies this, Regulation is more complex than most fuels regulation is. You, you cannot just simply take a uh, sample of renewable diesel and measure the carbon intensity through a lab test. Um, the calculation of the well to wheels or fuel to wheels from start to finish carbon intensity um, needs to be done. Uh, the uh, the different states that have implemented this have different regulatory procedures, but but they all center around requiring a verification body of some sort to uh, validate the pathway and validate the carbon intensity from start to finish. One piece of that is the indirect land use cost of, of growing the crop and potentially displacing uh, s some additional n natural uh, field or forest that, that, that might need to be taken. Um, there have been different models for that and those have changed with time. So, so to directly answer the question, yes, it has been challenged. Yes, some of the assumptions in these models have changed with time. And the different regulatory authorities have a framework in place that any individual facility needs to apply for with the verification process. Right, I'll just add to that, that for um, CARB in particular in California, there are um, spreadsheets available that have the uh, the factors that are associated with with the travel distance for feedstocks to facilities and for finished products to final market disposition, and so that framework has been set up and put into spreadsheets for uh, refiners or 
uh, prospective producers to uh, have access to. All right, great answers. Okay, here is a question for Gary. On an existing facility using the existing metallurgy, can you advise how much co-processing can be done? So for uh, a co-processing facility, the, it's gonna depend on, on what sort of tan the, the unit was originally designed for. Uh, tans up to about four or five for the for the blended feed are typically going to be acceptable for carbon steel in in the low temperature section of the unit. Um, in addition to that, I think one of the rules thumbs that people could use at looking at um, how much uh, renewable feedstock could be put in uh, Matt's one of Matt's slides showed that the consumption could be anywhere from two thousand maybe to twenty five hundred scuffs per barrel. So if you had a, a diesel or gas oil feedstock that was consuming, say, 800 scuffs per barrel, you can count on backing out three barrels of your uh, fossil fuel diesel in order to process one barrel of renewables in order to stay in a hydrogen and pretty close to a heat release balance. Great answer. Um, here's another question for you, Gary. Can you elaborate um, on the exothermic reaction as opposed to typical hydro processing and a temperature increase that might occur? Right, so I think Matt had a slide that showed that. When we talk about uh, conventional petroleum hydro processing, we're looking at something around 70 BTUs per scuff for HDS, HDN, aromatic saturation with olefin saturation running about double that at about 140. Um, hydro cracking, on the other hand, is a bit lower in the 50 to 60 BTUs per scuff range. Um, just strictly going from uh, heats of formation and dipper, we can see that uh, the heat release associated with renewables is on the order of uh, 95 to 105 uh, BTUs per scuff, and that variation being accounted for as was mentioned, uh, uh, vegetable oil uh, feedstocks have are more unsaturated, and those olefins are clicking at, at over 100, say up to 120, 140 uh, VTUs per scuff of hydrogen consumption. So, the, the overall average is actually as much as one and a half to two times um, what people see for conventional uh, re refining processes, and that's why um, these type units need to be properly engineered. Excellent. Thank you, Gary. All right, here's a question from Matt. Matt, can you speak a, bit, a little bit more about what typical pretreatment sections might look like? Sure, and, and, and the, 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 there are different approaches to this. The, the traditional pretreatment approach that has been utilized in both biodiesel production, but also in edible oil production, is often poured over to renewable diesel facilities. Uh, that, that process uh, consists of a degumming step with, with uh, washing and centrifuges at the heart of it, and a bleaching step uh, using bleaching earth to remove impurities. And so there is a solids handling step to, to import and export bleaching earth as part of that. Um, additional filters are part of that process as well, um, especially to remove the, the bleaching earth at, at the back end. Um, there are additional processes as well. Uh, there has, has been, been some, some research and pilot into uh, thermal processes to try to handle pretreatment. Um, Renewable diesel is a bit different than, than, than these other processes in that it can accommodate free fatty acids a bit more directly than the biodiesel process can. Um, there is a metallurgy impact, as, 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 as Gary mentioned, but uh, th there certainly is some potential in some cases to, to consider uh, non-traditional processes that, that may preserve some of the free fatty acids as an alternate in pretreatment. Right, so just to, to build on what, what Matt's referring to in terms of the alternate process, um, the, the benefit of it is that there's phospholipids, there's compounds in there that contain the contaminants that we don't want, like phosphorus, and this alternate process can preserve the hydrocarbon portion of those molecules. 
Uh, but it, 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 in doing so, it creates a greater concentration of these free fatty acids. So it, it, can, it will drive um, feedstocks that may have a, a, a free fatty acid content that would be amenable to carbon steel. Um, coming out the back end of this pretreatment unit, carbon steel would no longer be acceptable. So uh, this uh, particular technology is probably uh, better associated with new build construction than it is with uh, retrofits. All right, great, thank you. All right, Matt, another question for you. Do you know how many commercial plants are in operation and what the total capacity is? So, so in, in, in the US, there are, uh, I believe, at, at this point, three significant facilities in operation with, with several others in construction and planning. Um, feeding into the US market, th there is an additional uh, large facility in, in Asia. A and then there is a collection of facilities in Europe. And so if you add it up compared with, with the, the many hundreds of, ref of petroleum refineries on, around the world, the number of renewable diesel facilities is much smaller. Um, it is growing significantly though, and, and growing significantly relative to the number of facilities that, that are in operation today. Um, as refiners uh, look at the market today, one of the great values of renewable diesel is that it allows a it allows producing perhaps a smaller number of barrels, but having those barrels be of a much higher value. And as the refining industry is looking at the energy transition, um, there are many refineries where, where, where that trade-off may make a lot of sense. And where converting an existing refinery to be a renewable diesel facility um, may make a lot of sense because the capacity is, because, because the margin is quite high, and the incentive and growth in the market is quite high as well. Okay. Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll just add a, a quick one to that. Um, COVID, hit, COVID hit everybody hard last year, and there are some facilities that uh, have implemented renewables projects where the, the revenue from the renewables project carried the rest of the entire refinery from, from into a profitability state, I'll say. So, it, it, it's been big leverage for those that have implemented it. Absolutely. All right, so here's another technology question. I'm gonna direct it to Gary. Gary, what is your experience with different licensors and are you in regular contact with them to keep abreast of changes in their technology? Yes, yeah, so within the SoCal office, uh, we have uh, two projects involving the, um, the two primary North American licensors at this time. There, just within those projects alone, we have constant interaction with those licensors, so we know um, what they're doing, what what improvements they're making, whether or not they can be adapted for the current project, or um, are just knowledgeable for their potential implementation on a future project. Yeah, and and and, and to to build on what what Gary suggested, you know, the the, the renewable diesel trend is. Uh, it is not regional, it is global. Um, it is uh, quite large and focused in North America and throughout North America, both the US and Canada. It, and and uh, there are different regulations driving it, but to the same effect in Europe as well. And so this is something that that floor is, is staying very close to and is very active in both, both in active projects and in uh, looking at the future of the market um, worldwide. So, thanks for that, Matt. It, it triggered in my brain uh, a little additional color here right now renewable diesel is very much in vogue but uh, you know people looking with a long enough uh, time horizon even though these projects have a very short payout uh, could could see that uh, demand for renewable diesel could get displaced by EVs and so some clients are looking at the option of con converting these units in the future for renewable jet production where we see that that demand for that uh, that fuel um, isn't going to go away anytime soon based on the uh, ability to get planes in the air. Great clarification. Okay, Matt, I've got a question for you now on the economics. It seems that most of the profitability is linked to the federal and state credits. 
Will companies really invest knowing that they are relying on credits that may fade away? Will they be relying on importing renewables, if that's even possible, rather than producing within the U.S.? Sure, and, and it, I, I might flip, flip back to slide ten as I'm talking as I'm talking through this. So, the the, the credits that uh, are in place here are in some cases credits that have been on the books for years in the U.S. The renewable fuel standard is, is a decade or more old, um, and the uh, the and, and the renewable fuel standard does move up and down with time to cover the time periods where the blender's tax credit is not in play. So, so, so that is a, a very long standing incentive that, that there uh, is every indication should continue. The low carbon fuel series that are really driving this, uh, the, the law in California is authorized for many years in the future. And uh, I, I, I am. And, and, and with the preference that I am an engineer, not a political analyst. Uh, all of the uh, political discussions are more tr in the realm of how do we make this law stronger versus how do we make this law weaker? The further discussion uh, within Oregon, within the state of Washington, British Columbia, Canada, um, other states in the US, again, there is much, much more discussion in the realm of how do we make these laws stronger versus how do we make them weaker? So the laws on the books today, which are driving the incentives shown on this table, those laws are authorized for, for a decade or more into the future. And, uh, and, and the economic projections that we've been talking about and that our clients are looking at are based on those laws. Uh, with the knowledge that if anything, it's most likely going to become even more incentivized. Um, further that the other point is that the potential rate of return on these projects is quite rapid. And so, uh, Owner operators do not need to consider what will the laws be 30 years in the future. They only need to consider what will the laws be for the next five years um, because their, their project economics will, will likely become very positive d d during that brief period. Right. And since Matt has this uh, slide pulled up, I think it'd be opportune to address the renewable jet versus renewable question in uh, a little bit more detail. We can see in this uh, table here that renewable renewable jets carrying a, a somewhat lower value than um, uh, renewable diesel, especially from a, a low carbon intensity feedstocks like DCO or tallow. Um, the airlines are definitely interested in competing for renewable jet to be green, but uh, there's a, a lot of forces at work that are uh, causing people to stay with renewable uh, diesel production um, over renewable jet because uh, renewable jet has a higher uh, carbon intensity due to the additional processing, including chemical hydrogen consumption, which reflects itself in a, in a lower uh, LCFS value. Also, uh, renewable diesel is assigned a higher energy density than jet so that you can actually blend jet into renewable diesel and get an upgrade uh, with no penalty on the energy density. And finally, at the federal level, renewable diesel earns 1.7 RINs versus 1.6 RINs. So that's about 6% more uh, right there. So uh, things need to change a bit to motivate. Um, the market will have to drive us to a renewable jet because the economics aren't there yet for, for producers. Excellent discussion. Okay, let's see. I've got a couple more technology questions. Uh, I'll send the first one to Gary. Are the catalysts reclaimable or regenerable? I believe, yes, both are. Um, the HDO catalysts are, uh, they, they're licensure specific, but from the, what we've learned in the open literature, they would be uh, a nickel moly sulfided catalyst that would be regenerable. Um, if you talk uh, two-stage processing, you have uh, a noble metal uh, isomerization catalyst. That one I'm not as clear on, to be honest, whether they're regenerable or not, but it, I would assume so. I, I think some of what the contaminants and poisons for those can actually be addressed uh, in situ uh, with hot hydrogen stripping. Terrific. Thank you. Um... 
here's another question for you, Gary. Do the reactors need to resemble hydrocrackers where you need multiple hydrogen quench points within the reactor? Good question. So we, we saw from the the heat release that what's going on there and, and the amount of consumption is yes. If if you were screening um, existing uh, hydro processing units within your within your facility uh, for potential renewables production, you'd want to be looking for a, rack, uh, a reactor or a combination of reactors that probably had at least three or four. Uh, probably four catalyst beds would be would be better to handle the HDO portion, and then uh, one or maybe two beds for the, the hydroisomerization step. That um, I would say coupled with um, gas circulation rate, because we've seen that chemical consumption is you know on the order of 2,000 plus gas per barrel. So an initial screening. Uh, of units would look at those two key elements, especially since they're both the longest lead items if, and speed to market is is key here. So that's what we've done on, on our recent projects in order to move projects forward because we work really hard to figure out how to use existing compressors to um, satisfy the process needs. Yeah, great. And just to build on that, it, it might be worth flipping back to slide 24 just to show the information that that, that Gary was referencing. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, we have been involved with, with many uh, hydro treater, hydro cracker, and now renewable diesel uh, revamps. Um, see, I, I, I'm so sorry, I, I'm a slide off. It would be, be the, the, the next slide there. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, the um, so, so the uh, and 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 in those revamps, e even if a reactor existing reactor vessel is perhaps not suitable, um, the remaining equipment may be suitable, and perhaps it may be that using that existing reactor vessel in conjunction with with, with some additional equipment may may still allow getting to a renewable diesel facility at a much lower cost than a grassroots facility would be. Cost okay. schedule. Absolutely. All right. So I'm looking at the Q and a tab and I'm thinking we're not going to get through everything. So feel free to submit more questions and we will submit answers. We'll, we'll provide answers later, but I think we have time for 1, maybe 2 more questions. Um, Matt, this 1's for you. It's sort of a supply chain question. The demand curve, the curve just shows demand to be high, but are there is there enough supply and distribution available? To meet the demand. Good, good question. Um, may, maybe a way to color that is that over the last about 20 years in the U.S. in the biofuels market, um, the consumption of soybean oil for uses other than biodiesel has remained relatively constant, while a significant amount of biodiesel consumption has been added to that, and so soybean oil production has certainly gone up to to meet that demand. Um, in renewable diesel, certainly the, the most carbon efficient feedstocks, things like used cooking oil and, and the like, uh, will, will likely be used first, and there is lim a limited supply of those. But there is a bank of, of vegetable oil feedstocks that can be either diverted from existing biodiesel uses or that can see some increased production. And that combination, plus a, the potential of future uh, feedstocks that are dedicated just to the fuels market, uh, things like camelina oil and other feedstocks that, that, that are being tested now and could come into play as this market becomes more mature, um, lead to at least some reasonable projection of some additional feedstock availability. So, so I'll just add to that. Uh, I recently read an interesting article that was addressing the different types of feedstocks that that renewables fuels uh, producers could source. And they made the point that cattle farmers aren't going to increase the size of their herds or, or um, in order to produce more uh, fats or tallows for production. It's going to be driven by their primary market uh, of su supply of, to the food chain. So that's definitely a consideration in, in looking at uh, a refiner or producer would would want to factor in in making their selections. Okay, thank you. I think we have time for one last question. I'm going to send it to Gary. 
Is there a renewable feedstock that would not require any pretreatment scope and how readily available is it if it exists um, on the market? Not that I'm aware. Uh, the, the most uh, commonly used feedstock uh, that we've seen so far is soybean oil. It has, uh, it's, it's pretty uh, easily treated. Uh, it can, the, in terms of the pretreatment step, it, it can use uh, enzymatic degummy as, instead of acid degummy. And um, it does have uh, at the high end of uh, chemical hydrogen consumption. So it, it's a good choice for uh, an upper bracket on, uh, from a design perspective on, on number of beds, heat release, uh, chemical hydrogen consumption, re -gas, recycled gas circulation rates and could be coupled with something lower, um, like a, a, a tallow or a grease in order to uh, have a robust design of a plant for future flexibility. Yeah, and, right. and, and the, 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 the only feedstock that I know that fits that is one that's been pre-treated by somebody else, and, 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 and that does exist on the market today. Great. Yeah, I, I, I should have been clear. I was referring to pre-treated soybean oil. That I, I don't know of ones that could be just uh, processed without any sort of pretreatment step. All right. I think Matt, Gary and Matt could talk about this subject all day. I'm going to have to cut you off because that's all the time we have for questions right now. I want to thank you both, Gary and Matt, for the time that you've spent today and in preparation for this webinar. And I want to say thank you to our audience for attending. You have been very engaged and it's been a pleasure being your moderator. We will be hosting our next webinar on Thursday, April 22nd at 9 a.m. Central, where floor subject matter experts Topi Karim, Javier Fernandez de la Fuente, and Patrick Goodman will be talk will talk about powering the future with green hydrogen. Please keep in touch with your floor contacts, follow our social media postings, or head to the Innovation Builders page on floor.com to register for this or other future webinars. We appreciate your attention and thank you again for dialing in. We will send out a compiled list of the Q and A's as soon as the webinar recording is available on demand on floor.com. This usually takes about a week. If you have any questions or require additional information, please email innovation.builders at floor.com and someone from our team will get back with you. From all of us on the Innovation Builders team, have a safe day. Mm -hmm.